Um, I got a thermal video here of something watching us on a ridge. We weren't anticipating that anything would actually happen. I wasn't hoping to see anything, and I honestly didn't want to see anything. We were kind of hanging out, got everything set up, kicking back until it got a little later. We started setting up camp. I was looking forward to relaxing. It had been a really long day. And then we kind of went down the trail to see if we could hear anything, and sure enough, <laughs> something did happen. And I had my headlamp on, and I just started scanning the ridge. And as I was scanning the ridge, two big glowing eyes shining right back at us. Located in an area of Southern California, the Los Padres National Forest is a large wilderness compromised of dry desert and high alpine mountains. Having grown up in Southern California, I never imagined that something undiscovered could stay hidden in this area. Having hiked and backpacked in many areas of the neighboring San Gabriel Mountains, I was certain that something like Sasquatch would be isolated to the forests of the Sierra Nevada and humbled. While I thought that reports of footprints and sightings in the Southern Sierras were credible, I couldn't imagine something migrating out of the mountains, through desert foothills, then into the mountains high above the SP wilderness without being seen by several people. I found myself questioning how stealth-like something would have to be to secretly make this journey. I was, like many, Surprised that in the spring of 2021, a black bear wandered out of the southern Sierra Nevada mountains and into open desert. It walked approximately 30 miles undetected into the desert town of Ridgecrest. The bear wasn't spotted until it walked into a Walmart parking lot, causing the Walmart to go into lockdown. Could something else of higher intelligence covertly lurk the Sierra Nevada mountains through the Gorman area and into the Los Padres National Forest? In 2016, Tate Hieronymus and Austin Brown were in an isolated area and had an encounter that they could not explain. This encounter was recorded on a thermal imager. After meeting Tate a year prior to this, and viewing his footage, I decided that I needed to investigate this myself. Could it have been a bear? A deer? Could it have been a misrepresentation of size and distance? And could it be something as simple as a bird? These are the questions I came with. I met Tate last night. We drove miles through a pothole filled road we found a place to camp for the night. The next day, Austin Brown would meet us and we would head to the area where this encounter took place. Sierra Nevada mountains, the whole Pacific Northwest. There are a lot of places where I'd rather go look for Bigfoot. Not in this deserty place. But when we head up that mountain up there, things are supposed to really change. The road that takes you from the hot desert floor into the high alpine mountains is the worst road I have personally ever traveled on. Water drainages were about a foot and a half deep and we bounced up and down the mountain for over an hour and a half. No one really travels these roads. 
we arrived at the area where we would camp. I wasn't expecting it, and I wasn't looking for it, and I figured it was something more that lived in people's minds more than anything else. When I saw it, it was already looking at me. It had already seen me, it already knew that I was there, and it stayed perfectly still. Not like an animal. It wow. seemed to me to be more like a, like a conscious being, more in a sense than a normal wild animal would be, that they're just behaving unconsciously on instinct. This was making a decision to look at me. I, I have no other explanation for what I saw. We were surprised with an amazing sunset. We were joined by some LA area friends of Tate's. Remember? Walk some way, yeah. I think we should try that. Are you guys in the one tent? Yeah. Three. I gotta try, I gotta charge my camera. Wait, which side? Right here where this tent is. I'm gonna move my own over there. Oh, oh, I okay. see. Should we move our side first? I'll have to uh I'll have to get you guys a couple of these t shirts. Podcast yes, yes, yes. Yeah. That's the one Rain was on, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I recognize the name. Uh, Have you seen the 50th one? This is the 50th. Wow. Because it's, you know, I was talking to Raymond on the podcast, and we were like thinking like they migrate probably through this area every four to five years, and it's been about that time since we've had that since we've had that. Uh, no, it's been a little longer than that. 2017 is only four years. Oh, okay then, yeah. You severely burned your hot dog. Yeah, but so do you like any uh, hot dog with your char? <laughs> I, I do like my hot dogs burned. They look like Luke's parents. You guys want to listen? Hey, should we try my knocker, the one I have? I have this one right here in my hands. I was about to do it right now. Do we delay the whole process and then you go down? Okay, good, good, good. to go out, break up into a couple teams, and uh, see what happens. Our plan for the night was to walk the roads, do knocks, and call blast a vocalization that was recorded in the woods of Kentucky by a researcher named Charlie Raymond and his partner. Uh, Tate's going to do some, some calls. He's going to call blast, and there's no light pollution out here, so we're able to see with just the moonlight, Nothing. all the way on the other side of the ridge. He's gonna do some call blast of some vocals. And uh, we're back here, we're gonna answer with some knocks. Peace. We heard that really clear. Uh, 
All right. Off to the uh, area where these two had their thermal siding. So you see like all those branches hanging off? Yeah. Right there? I think it's that one right there. Yeah, awesome. This is the view. That tree's blocking our view shed. So from there to there, that was our line of sight. So you guys were standing over there? We were standing over there. Okay. And then we were looking at it, but you can kind of see those lights in the background. After trying multiple positions, we determined that the newly fallen tree is directly in our line of sight. Any perfect recreation we imagine making wouldn't be happening. It was darker than this and it was colder than this. Yeah. And there was absolutely no wind. So that's why we went to that spot and I was filming. And you can kind of see those lights out there. That's why we were thinking it was probably that. Right. And so this is why I don't think it was bear behavior, mountain lion behavior, deer behavior. Because when it made that call, I didn't know where it was. And it saw us and heard us for sure before we started filming anything. I got two minutes of the footage, and so there had to be at least another minute before we saw it. When they had their encounter, Tate and Austin pulled up in the dark to the end of the road near Seward Mountain. They had not seen the area in the daytime, and that was the same introduction of the area that I wanted. As Tate and Austin showed where their encounter took place, we tried to position in a way that would make an exact recreation. I turned off my headlamp and walked alone to the area where the subject stood. I wanted to see for myself what it would be like to walk the ridge and stand in the slope where this thing stood with no light. This night, it wouldn't be as much of a challenge since the moon was ultra bright. We decided to call it a night and head back to camp but would return the next day in the daylight. What's cool is I can click on the, I don't know where the drone is at exactly. <laughs> so behind me here is the Sespe Wilderness and the Condor Sanctuary area. Dude, that sounded funny. The Condor Sanctuary area. Yeah, sanctuary that's... area area. Condor Sanctuary Zone. Yeah, is that what it is? I was just, I'm giving you an idea. Zone ah. <laughs> section. All right. So behind me here is the Sespe Wilderness and the Condor Sanctuary Zone. It was on this mountain here that Tate and Austin had their encounter that night. We're gonna go take a look at where that encounter took place during the daytime and tried to do, that's okay. I can cut it out right there. You can bring that camera over here whenever you're ready. Stay there, stay crouched down like that. If it's crouching down like that, dude, that is the perfect place for it to crouch down. Yeah. Now, I, in the video makes so much more sense. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Well, I was waiting for that. Um, go. Yeah, go. Do it now. Thank you. That was like perfect. Excellent. That looked good. Yeah. Dude, I got such a great. I got such. Oh my god, I got such a great shot, dude. With every picture.
picture or piece of footage, there are two sides of data. The first set of data is what was recorded, the footage. The second set of data is what happened behind the camera, the backstory, the people involved, and the equipment used. That's perfect. In the Bigfoot world, we too many times see only the first set of data. Pictures posted of suits, stumps, and trees are presented as real, but the second set of data is never explored. As you'll find out, if you haven't already, that second set of data usually destroys the credibility of the story. That's why the backstories to the Patterson-Gimlin film, for example, are so intriguing. With the Patterson-Gimlin film, the stories, or second set of data, lends to the credibility of the footage. In the daylight, I started to understand what happened to these two much better. Some of these pictures were provided to me by Tate. He took these the day after the encounter, and these show accurate sizing with his thermal footage. Tate recorded with the Fleur Scout TK. It's a thermal imager with a range of approximately 100 yards, which happens to be about the distance of the film subject. This unit is sold for about $500. I got a thermal video here of something watching us on a ridge. Um, well, the time that we started setting up camp, I want to say it was probably around 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. So it was dark, um, but not so dark that you couldn't see with the naked eye. I went out here because I was with Matt Moneymaker that whole day because we were checking out other spots that people um, had stuff happen. And I was like, hey, where should we go? He's like, take this road all the way back to this trailhead. And so we went there. We were kind of hanging out, got everything set up, having some beers and just kicking back until it got a little later. I think first, you know, obviously we set up camp and we got a couple of our things ready and Tate grabbed his gear and it was a lot colder than I expected as well. It wasn't very windy, but it was very, very cold. I'm gonna go with Tate and I'm gonna humor him and we'll see where this goes. We're not gonna hear anything. We're not gonna see anything. We're just gonna go back to camp where I wanna be so I can relax and uh, kick off for the night. There was like a dead tree, so I wanted to do a couple knocks. So I did a couple of them. The sound did not carry like I wanted to. So I was like, well, I'll just do a whoop. So I did a whoop. And then we're kind of talking, and then like I, all of a sudden I hear a response back to what sounded just like my whoop. And I was like, dude, I was like, Austin, we gotta, there's, I heard something. There's this overlook I kind of saw, so let's go back and kind of scan the ridge right there. I just stood there and Tate said, did you hear that? And I said, you hear what? I didn't hear anything because I had my hoodie on and I had my headband on and my ears were cold and plus I didn't want to hear anything, so I wasn't really listening. Um, and Tate said, I thought I heard something over there on the other side of this ridge. And uh, all right, let's go. Let's go see whatever isn't there. And we walked back down a little bit and then back up to another side to where Tate thought he heard the sound from. And as we walk up that part of the hill, there was this big um, tree, tree, um, fallen tree that was sort of blocking our path. So we stopped right there and I had my headlamp on and I just started scanning the ridge. And as I was scanning the ridge, and we see these eyes like looking at us. I mean, plain as day, it was one of the first things that I saw was two big glowing yellowish orange eyes shining right back at us. We had our headlamps on because we were seeing eyes shine. Like as we looked in its direction, it was already fixated on us. It already had made us, it knew where, where we were at. and. I was frozen. I had absolutely no idea what it was. Um, and I was just trying to see what I wasn't seeing, or I was trying to disprove what I was seeing. So there was some city lights way in the background and I was kind of hoping, oh, that's the city lights. So I sort of swayed back and forth like this to see if the, the eyes would move. And um, they didn't, they stayed right where they were. And that's when I started to record with the FLIR. This 
is the SoCal Bigfoot thermal footage. Standing in the area and reviewing the footage, I determined that whatever this was stands up fluidly from a crouched position. According to Austin, who watched it the entire time, it stood perfectly still, stared at them for some time, then stood up, turned, and walked down the mountain. This matches up with what is on Tate's footage. At this point, I was trying to pin it on a bear. Bears are commonly known to stand up on their hind legs temporarily. However, they don't walk away without dropping back down. Another issue posed with the black bear in this situation is that while their sense of smell is excellent, their vision is very poor. The black bear has decent eyesight for about 30 yards. Past that, a bear heavily relies on its sense of smell, especially in the dark. A bear standing completely still, staring back at Tate and Austin, who are 100 yards away, then walking on its hind legs doesn't seem plausible to me. You see, in the footage, this thing stands, turns, then walks down the steep part of the mountain. Everything that Austin said matches this. This encounter also began with Tate saying he heard something possibly vocalized back to him. I can't explain away what Tate and Austin saw. It's not a human navigating in the dark, alone on a mountainside with no headlight walking down a ridge. I can't identify it as an animal. Stories like this have been told since the days when the Native Americans were the only inhabitants of this land. These stories of glowing eyes from humanoids that live in the forest have gone on for centuries. My conclusion is that Tate and Austin encountered that very thing on this night. The footage is not damning, but with more context, you realize that this is a true encounter with Sasquatch. Go. Yeah, go. Do it now. Thank you. try it. So what I think happened when it first came up there and heard us, it was crouching down like on its knees like that because we could see eye shine. And then right when it stood up was when Austin said, oh, it's gone. And that's when I was still recording when we left. And that's when you see it stand up in the film and we walked down, it walked down that way and we walked back to our truck. So, I mean, that is really steep. Can't be any of those animals that are known to this forest. To me, it was either a human or a Bigfoot, and there's no way that a human walk would walk up this <laughs> terrain no at that time of night with no light. Fine. <laughs> when I initially spoke to Tate, he didn't tell me I have a video of a Bigfoot. He said, I have a video of something in the dark, turning around and walking away down a very steep hillside at night with no light on. I took a look at it and I concur with what he says. It looks like a humanoid figure. I don't think that there's any way that what he recorded was a human. It just doesn't fit the bill for a human to walk down that terrain at that time with no light on. When I saw those eyes looking right back at me, immediately my mind was saying, okay, what could it be that's not a Bigfoot? Okay, could it be a deer? Could it be a bear? Could it be um, an owl? Could it be someone pranking us, you know, and shining lights back at us or reflective thing or anything like that? And I'm just trying to disprove what I saw. And, and I think if anything is evidence that you are afraid to really believe what you see, you try to disprove it and you try to contradict it and criticize it. And I was left with the conclusion that I have no other explanation for what I saw. I'm Jonathan Easley, and thanks for watching Western Bigfoot Exploration. Thank you.